Okay, this is my first try at a screencast. <coughs> and as you can hear, I still have my cough. But it was better. Um, so we're going to look at expectation values. So we define the expectation value, last go round, of an operator like this. So we sandwich the operator in between the psi and the psi star. So that's the expectation value of a system described by psi. Now there are some nice special cases. Some nice special cases when it turns out that those psi's are already the eigenstate or eigenvector of the operator. So we know that the operators have eigenvalues and that the psi i are the eigenvectors or eigenfunctions <coughs> and they they form a space, they span the space. You can think of them as like directions in the Hilbert space. They form the basis of the Hilbert space and they really do act a lot like i, j, k and did, did in, in physics 1. They, they give us directions, in this case in a Hilbert space. So if we have psi i that are normalized and we know the eigenvalues the omega i, we know the action of the omega operating on psi i. When omega acts on psi i, it yields the eigenvalue and the same vector back. Now because of that nice property, if we calculated the expectation value of an operator omega and the state was one of its eigenstates, like this, we would see a really nice result. That omega operator, x, produces this eigenvalue, and we're left with just the integral psi i star psi i dx, which is 1. 1. So we get this very nice result the expectation value of an operator if it's acting on one of its eigenstates is just the eigenvalue of that eigenstate. So that's a really special case. <coughs> but it's nice to know that special case because we can use it to move on to a more general case. Now what do we mean by general? By general we mean that we can write any state, oops, try that again, any state, as just the sum over eigenstates, psi1, psi2, psi3, with some coefficients like that and like that. So this is really a lot like how we could write any position in physics 1 in terms of i, j, and k, the unit vectors that span space, and some distance along each of those unit vectors. Well, here, the psi's are like the i, j, and k, and the a, i's are like the amount along that direction. So, in the end, we can write this <coughs> very compactly, any state, as a sum like that. Now, I should say that it's nice to normalize that full wave function psi, and what we mean by normalization is that when we do that integral, we're going to get 1. So if we do that, if we want to normalize the wave function, or if we have a normalized wave function, we would substitute in for the psi star and the psi. We get this double sum over i and j. <coughs> but there's these nice properties that we know, that the psi's are orthogonal, that is the psi i star psi j when integrated over all space gives either 0 or 1. 0 if i is not equal to j, and 1 if i is equal to j. So only the i, i terms are going to survive. So we know that. Um, and that, that makes this fairly ugly looking integral with sums in it sort of decay into something that's fairly simple. So we only have psi i star psi i. And because we know the value of this integral, this integral, <coughs> 
that integral is just 1, we're left with just the sum over the square of the coefficients is 1. So normalization means that when we sum over the squares of all of the coefficients, we get 1. That's a nice result. It's going to be really useful for some things in just a moment. <clears throat> One of the nice things is that we can interpret these, these, psi, these uh, coefficients as just probabilities. We sum over all the probabilities of finding the system in some allowed state, we should get 1. So we can interpret the, the square of A1 is just the probability of being in 1, the square of A2 is probability of being in 2, and so on. So it's really nice. And because we've now used that normalized wave function and have these nice A's that sum, that their squares sum to 1, the expectation value of a more general wave function like this isn't so bad. We substitute in for each of the wave functions, a double sum again. Once again, we know when we operate on psi j, we get omega j, and there should be, I should fix that, there should be a that there too. And because of orthogonality, <coughs> once again, we know this is true. So we can write um, our expectation value as just uh, a kind of integral summing over the ai squareds, the eigenvalues, and that integral again, which once again we know is 1. So the upshot of all of this is the expectation value then for a normalized wave function could be just written as the sum of the coefficient squared times each of the eigenvalues, or probability of being in state i times the value in state i. So it really does look like this nice weighted average. <coughs> and that's one of the reasons why we really do like to normalize wave functions, because we have this nice probability interpretation of the coefficient squared and this nice result here. Now, Suppose we're going to be lazy, and by that I mean that we don't want to bother wave with uh, normalizing a wave function, which could be a lot of work. Or someone has given us a wave function and we don't know if it's normalized. Are we lost? Can we, do, can we still do something? And the answer is yes, we can. We, we're going to have to calculate an expectation value. We're going to have to take into account that the wave function isn't normalized to 1. We can do that by writing the expectation value. <clears throat> like so, where we've added this piece here, which is really the magnitude of the wave function or magnitude squared of the wave function. So we're sort of dividing out by that factor that it should have been 1. And if the wave function is normalized, this denominator would in fact be 1. So we have a way of handling this. Um, and sometimes it's actually easier to just do this rather than normalizing the wave function. The wave function normalization could be quite hard. Maybe it's easier just to brute force through the integral and be done. That certainly happens sometimes. <coughs> okay, let's review where we are. First, we can write out any state in terms of the eigenstates and some coefficients. So we can write out any state in terms of the psi i's, the eigenstates or eigenvectors, and the a i. And remember, those psi i's are like directions in our Hilbert space, and the a is the, the piece along that direction, just like we did in physics 1. Now, <coughs> if our wave function, our full wave function, is normalized, some nice things happen. Now remember, normalized means that. Okay, if it's normalized, then we know a few things. The square, the sum of the squares of the coefficients has to equal 1. That's really a statement that the probability of being in some state is 1. And that allows us to interpret this square as just the probability of being in that state, which is really nice. So now we have a direct interpretation of what these things here actually mean. They're related to the probability. <coughs> and the square is the probability in this normalized case. The expectation value, then, 
just turns into this fairly simple sum. It's really just the sum of the probability of the state i times the eigenvalue in state i, and that's expectation value. Okay, if psi is not normalized, and of course that means that, then things are a little different. The sum of the coefficients is not 1, the coefficient squared. And while we can interpret these as being proportional to the probabilities, they are not the probabilities because you did not do the normalization. Now that's still useful because certainly <clears throat> we can get relative probabilities out. When the coefficients are bigger, the probabilities are bigger, and so on. If we want to calculate an expectation value, we have to do some extra work. We have to calculate this thing where that denominator is taking into account the not being normalized. <clears throat> okay, so um, just sort of summarizing again, quantum mechanics, and we all know that quantum mechanics does have an H here. Quantum mechanics is a statistical theory, and you can sort of see that right here. When we measure every individual measure, it always gives an eigenvalue. So when we do any single measurement, we always find the eigenvalue of the operator, every single measurement. However, as we do uh, repeated measurements over a quantum mechanical ensemble, and remember, a quantum mechanical ensemble is a set of identically prepared states that we can measure on. So we find the probability of... of Finding each eigenvalue, we sort of build that up. We measure, and what we get an eigenvalue. We measure again, we get a different eigenvalue. And if we do that over and over and over again, we can discover the probability of each eigenvalue occurring. <coughs> and that's the statistical nature of the theory. It's like if you have a, um, a six-sided die that's been uh, monkeyed with, the way you can find out what happened is by rolling the die over and over and over again and seeing, okay, well, which, which side is more probable than the other. If it weren't monkeyed with, of course, they'd all be the same. So the, <coughs> excuse me, the expectation value is really just the average over all of the recorded measurements then. And we can interpret that in terms of uh, probability as well. Now there are a few expectation values that are of particular interest. The first one is the expectation value of the position. So we chose as our operator just x, and we sandwiched it in there between psi star and psi. We do the integral over all space, and that's the expectation value of the position, sort of the average position. We can also calculate the expectation value of the square of the position. Now, this is a little different because now we have x squared here. It's, it's not the same integral. It's not just the square of the previous result. And you can see that this is different because that x squared is always positive, that operator. Whereas this one, it could be negative. Now, neither of these are terribly hard to calculate if you have Mathematic or some tool, especially. But um, we can use them to go ahead and find the uncertainty in x, delta x. That's defined as the square of the Skype's talking to me. Let's turn the volume down. The square of the position minus the expectation value of the square, square root, absolute value. You want to do the same thing over here, right, for momentum. So now I have a way of measuring, well, calculating, delta x and delta p. Now, why is that useful? Because we can now test for any given wave function, does it follow Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? It better. If you find a wave function that doesn't follow the uncertainty principle, you've either made a mistake or you're about to win a Nobel Prize. I'd probably go with the mistake. <laughs>